Nobody in the village makes it. But in the village shop, they sell Maggi noodles. And I asked, do you have fair and lovely? And this lady looks at me and says, no, sir, but why do you want fair and lovely? I have fair and handsome. Hmm. I use these two as indicators almost across the country, including in Yavatmal, one of the top five backward districts in the country, the level of multinational market penetration. And unfortunately, those of us from the civil society have not yet found ways of tackling this. Thanks. Thank you, Amit and Nitya. With that, we will close the conversation for a time and we will take up the questions for uh, discussion. Yeah, initially, we will take a couple of questions, then uh, they will respond accordingly. We will proceed. Thank you, both of you, for the excellent presentation. And, oh, I'm Rama Narayanan. I'm from MS Swaminathan Research Foundation. Uh, the question I have here, I, I agree with the, many of the issues presented, but the problem that we now have at this stage, in whether uh, all of us who are in the domain of uh, development, who are in the development sector who work, is how do we gauge the worth of any program or any policy or any any kind of uh, intervention because many of these are now more and more the interrelationship between many issues are uh, becoming uh, uh, really very critical and uh, for example uh, with regard to this issue of uh, uh, technology or any such thing for the mixes and grinders which have been given just last week there was a report in the hindu which says very clearly how a section of people are now not getting employed because of the advent of technology for example those workers who are involved in that engraving that stone and who chisel out those ammi and other things you know the traditional grinders and so on um, so so on the one hand we need to look at the advantage technology empowers whether men or women on the other hand it is also throwing a lot of people so all all these times our uh, our approach to analysis approach to looking at has been only piecemeal whether technology helps or it doesn't help but uh, at every level if you look at the holistic uh, uh, interrelationship so i would like to know uh, from the speakers do you have any case study of one village where any kind of intervention which is supposed to empower women or not, but also caused a lot of these kind of interrelationship changes. Because increasingly we find even your observation that other caste groups are now becoming in politically also, they are forming alliances because they have feel threatened by the Dalit alliance. Because Dalit alliance was seen as an important strategy for empowerment. So can we have, is there any example of case studies which has looked at it holistically? and uh, of even in one village or one so on, where these kind of changes and how did different people and uh, different uh, power uh, social groups, their positions and power changed and how did they adjust? Topic of the discussion, gender caste, uh, gender caste and change in agrarian society. Um, putting all this discussion together, the piecemeal discussions together, I'm trying to understand what is the takeaway? What is the takeaway message? Should I be happy that there's a lot of macro policies, uh, you no know, induced changes in the agrarian society, which intentionally or in unintentionally is generating a lot of changes in terms of gender empowerment. Feminization of agriculture is happening, which is forcing women to take decision. Decision making by women is something which we welcome. Because we have always been saying that women are doing a labor role, no decision making role. Now women, whether they like it or not, they get into decision making. And then you have this working class migrating into unorganized sectors, shredding or shedding this burden of landlordism and saying that whatever little income they have, at least they have you no know, control over that income and they have control over decision making power. So there's some changes which is happening overall. And agriculture economy per se is like, you know, it's, it, that's a totally different story. So what is in total, given the context of the discussion, what is the major takeaway message? Should I feel happy about the whole change that is happening because in some way it's resulting in changes which we desire? Or uh, 
um, I take uh, two contrasting uh, uh, regions. One is the Kutch area in Gujarat, where uh, uh, we find uh, they are, uh, you know, uh, they get uh, very less rainfall, so they do only one season of farming. Then, even in that case, for about nine months, I mean, eight months, women are engaged in the uh, crafting, handicrafts, and all, they make money out of it. It's a good amount of money they make. It. Whereas the husbands, they migrate, they go as a Maldaris, taking the herds, and all, or they go, come to the Rajkot or towns to do the trade. Again, they do the trade, not the uh, majority of them, actually, do the things. So, this one case where, with little income from the land or any other the source, they, you know, they have a good, uh, manageable income. Because one factor is that the culture, uh, traditional culture that is followed for many years, it's not a new one. On the contrast, if you see the western part of Orissa, where we see the tribals, where with all those difficulties, with very poor earnings, even though they get two crops, or, you know, two crops, or, uh, but still the family is united, the husband doesn't migrate. Majority from the rural area, husband doesn't migrate, but they sustain in the family itself, either doing the leaf patta, that uh, leaf plates, or the tendo patta collection, all those things. So I think uh, culture also plays a role, which cannot be broken in a matter of few years or you know, to, you know, decades or so. So I think that we'll have to look into that as to how, under the influence, of course, the influence of the, the region, the region influence of uh, the things that... If the mic a bit closer, you're not very clear. Pardon? Yes. If the mic closer and repeat what you asked, then I can Shall I repeat? Yes. Okay. So I'm taking two contrasts. One is the Kutch area in Gujarat, where uh, with uh, only less rainfall, with only one farming, the women take care of uh, the handicrafts, or the income generation activities, and then they make quite a good amount, comparatively. Whereas the men, they take the herds and they do the, the maldaris, they take the herds, or they come to towns for a trade, not even for a menial work, but for the trades. On the contrast in the western Orissa, where we, the tribal area, we see the family united, where husband doesn't migrate. They, even though they do small jobs like leaf plate making or the tendo patta collection, even though they get very less, but then the migration is not there. So, culture is cultural factor is one thing that also plays a role, and also the influence of the the, the city influence is also. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I am Rohit Parasha, working with MSOSRF on project called Leveraging Agriculture for Nutrition. Uh, my question is is with uh, Dr. Mitra. Uh, during my master's thesis, I was working on a, uh, uh, analyzing a uh, situation in uh, Gujarat of a cotton seed production uh, producer company. There, uh, this question is regarding Narega. I mean, uh, it is always, I mean, most of the farmers in India are marginal and uh, are small scale or small holder farmers. In that case, I have seen where people who are working for Narega are literally not working on anything, are sitting idle, and a part of payment they have to give it to the the person who is organizing this work, and they won't be working. But this is definitely increasing the cost of cultivation for the farmer who ha has hardly some bigas of land. And uh, since this production was very labor intensive, so it was increasing the cost of production to a very high extent. So I mean, uh, it is. Uh, so my question is, it is not generally necessary that a landlord is uh, uh, is in a situation to pay, but he is not paying. But there are many other farmers who are who do not do not have capital at all to pay to the increased cost cost of cultivation. That is increasing due to Nariga. That is increasing due to the remuneration that they will the labors would be getting due to now, Nariga. I just have a counter question. That which district is this? This is Dungarpur. Uh, Rajasthan, yeah. It's not Gujarat. Uh, uh, it is a border uh, no, no. district. I mean, you walked in Dungarpur or Banaskanta or Sabarkanta way. That was Dungarpur and the village was Dungaria. Dungaria. Yeah. Hmm. I've been there, by the way. I don't agree with you. Because you stated an opinion, I'm stating an opinion, I don't agree. We, we can discuss that. We'll come back yeah. to that. Uh, Mithya, would you like to start? So you don't have a question, you made a comment. Fine. That uh, was a comment. What's your question? There is another question since you started with macro perspective. Uh, I just wanted to know, uh, I mean, there is definitely a transition of labor is going from uh, uh, 
from agriculture to non-agriculture labor and uh, transformation is going on I mean the same similar question what has been asked should we be happy about it or not That was great hearing you both actually you had touched my name is Gayatri and I'm from Madras School of Social Work Actually, I want to uh, pose a question regarding the implementation gap in RTE because uh, we can see that in slum areas, uh, actually I was touched or moved by a particular incident in a slum area which took place when I interacted with some children in a slum in Chennai wherein they were actually, the children were not ready to go to school but the parents were ready to leave them to the school. So, uh, I was very keen on whether the RTE is not being implemented in the school. That is the reason for which the children are not going to school. So, actually, uh, my research topic for the year is that. That is, uh, why uh, is it because RTE is not being implemented in the schools that the children don't want to go to school? Or is it some other in, uh, external things that they are indulged in? So, my question here is why or where is the in, uh, implementation gap that uh, you had told, like, uh, uh, 31st March 2013 is the last date for implementation for RTE. That is a, a benchmark. Uh, but it has not been implemented properly. So where is that implement implementation gap uh, being posed? We need to, I think, uh, depending on what is our own perspective, we should be happy or not. So if the, maybe if the Dalits or if the poor workers are happy, maybe, uh, or the Dalit women are happy, maybe the landlords will not be happy. But uh, we have to take a position in terms of whose happiness uh, we are looking out for because there is a trade-off. And this is an ideological stance, or this is a political stance that we are taking, that whatever work we do, whatever intervention we do, uh, there will be some definitely trade-offs in terms of, uh, resource control in terms of labor, in terms of decision making. And I think uh, there is not, we, it's very difficult to give a, uh, you know, that this is good and this is bad. I don't believe anything is good and anything is completely bad. You know, it's the typical glass half full or half uh, empty. But every intervention can have some positive things and some negative things. I think the challenge is how do we maximize and for whom? And taking a particular perspective on whose behalf are we working. Are we working on behalf of the tribal communities or on behalf of the landless or on behalf of the poor or on behalf of the women? And then on balance, is there a better effect uh, for that group than for, uh, uh, you know, relative, relative to others? So I think it's a very difficult question, but it involves some kind of uh, uh, positionality. The second point here is that also what are our standards or what are our benchmarks for deciding of you know who's happy and who's not. I mean we are using our own middle class or our own as a researcher that this is good. You know they may think something else is good but I think this is in research we call it the emic view or the etic view that you know is it the external perspective or is it the internal perspective. This is not to make it relativist at all but I think that sometimes people do have different standards. When we look at gender equality, for instance, I have learned maximum from some of the tribal villages and tribal populations in Jharkhand. They are seen as most illiterate, most backward, you know, useless, lazy. But in terms of really fighting up for gender rights, in terms of negotiating gender relations, in terms of participation in decision making, there is incredible amount of uh, uh, value in what their system uh, in what their system is. So I think that how do we uh, uh, trade off for ourselves that you know what is valued and uh, sometimes we get so much uh, as educated people we get so much influenced by our own like Millennium Development Goal says that you know tick box gender parity I remember one that that's just the one point that I want to say which I completely agree with education for all but one of the first goals of the MDGs, which was missed in 2005, was actually about gender parity in school enrollment. And very interestingly, they said in so many countries we have met the goal. I was looking at the figures, this was 2008, 
and we had just finished that 2005 and the reports were coming out. I was doing some work in Nigeria and they said, very good, we have attained gender parity. When I looked at the figures, I found that it is not because girls' enrollment has increased, but boys have dropped out. So actually they achieved gender parity, but at a much lower level. Rather than everybody moving up, they achieved gender parity at a much lower level. So that is nothing to be very happy about, that we have attained gender parity at a lower level for uh, everybody. I think the attempt should be to move to a higher level uh, for everybody. So I think that's a very hard uh, question, Ramat and uh, also Manjula, which uh, followed up that, you know, clearly there are positives and there are negatives. And I think on whose behalf, who was your target or whom were you intending to benefit? And that definitely there will be backlash. But did it to some extent benefit uh, those people on balance is something that we have to make a judgment on. And I think because a lot of development studies is about politics, it is about well, any kind of change. When we're talking about any kind of changing relations, you know, everybody is happy with the status quo. Whenever we want to make some change, somebody will be unhappy, somebody will oppose it. Because we are happy to do things like 9 to 5, we are happy to work. If I say, no, we have to work 9 to 7, we have changed the rules, then a lot of people will be unhappy. So I think, though productivity will improve. So I think it's the same thing. When we, whether we introduce technologies, we're expecting rural women, instead of 9 to 5, to work 9 to 7. We're extending their working day. But uh, then we are saying, are they happy or uh, uh, not happy? So it, it, are, it is these trade-offs that we need to look across these different indicators. It is very complex. And I think, uh, uh, you know, if we can see that overall there has been some positive change, I think that is something to be happy about. Yeah, actually I feel, I feel very happy because after a long time we have achieved a sustained level of high growth. The inflation rate has come down. We have sent people to Mars. Our leaders are so astute that there was a security threat perception to fight that would cost millions of dollars. So we invited the most powerful nations, most powerful president and security was taken care of. After all, our business sense has come up. I'm also very happy that last year alone, some six lakh children died of diarrhea. I'm very happy that we have now the distinction in every form of data, functional toilets, yet we haven't, our scientists have not designed continuous soap dispensers because some 90% of Indians don't wash their hands after going to the toilet, so diarrhea goes on. That's my perspective. I'm very happy that crimes against women have increased because now we are going to have in almost every cell a special woman cell, cell to deal with crimes against women, so employment is going to go up. I'm very happy that science and technology is not taught anymore in our schools. We are going to have the Ramayana and the Mahabharat compulsory. So that is also a perspective. To coming back to this question that Parashar raised in Dongaria, that G is in cahoots with the local politicians. He gets the maximum cut. I have a picture somewhere which I had labeled, men measure, women dig. In any case, after this Banas Kata, the told hue and cry about BT cotton and children from Dungapur going there and picking the cotton, that paper by uh, this uh, Nirabura. These people shifted this side and to Gotra. Nobody ever asks a question, how much work do our professors, our researchers, our academics do? Nobody asks a question, how much work does the Talati do? Yet when it comes to the Narega person, because that person is poor, is a tribal, we ask this question. How many Dunga in your study, how many Dunga case studies? I know of some in Bengali, it was done by Tushar Kanjilal in Bengal, because this brings in a very important thing that how do you as a development interventionist then plan? The literature of it goes back to Shigeru Ishikawa's paper, Labor Absorption in Asian Agriculture led to a long debate where the Nathan, Krishna Bhardwaj, Kain Raj, Kain Raj wrote a paper in EPW in 81, you can refer to that literature, where these things were discussed, you know. 
I mean, Raj called it labor risk and land risk. Basically, labor replacing versus capital replacing. How to counter mandate? What was not taken care of at that time was the ecological implications. How gradually the ecosystem services on which the poor depended, which built up the eco, I mean, the climate change resilience of that village, how that is getting eroded and further implement, I mean, creating problems. I think there are a few case studies in Hindi, which I can try and look at if you read Hindi. English, I really don't know. But there's many. Coming back to your question about the RT. Look, as an act, there's a long history of it from the constitution, from this. It says right to education, not to the building. Our bureaucrats, our whatever, made it, okay, how many toilets, how many ramps, and we have reduced it to that. If you're in, working on education, I mean, there's one person sitting here who can help you, Mrs. Swami Nathan. There's some very good literature, Monana Azad's books, where, you know, you can hold a classroom under a banyan tree, but you teach. And the beginning of that teaching is by teaching to question. Today, what we are doing in this whole, you know, half glass, half full religion, this, that, we are totally stifling the right to question. That is why your children don't go to school. The other reason, I don't, I haven't really investigated Tamil Nadu that way, but I found it in Andhra, I found it in Karnataka, as well as in the North, that, you know, just post-puberty girl children leave school. One reason is the molestation by the teachers, inappropriate touching, and upper caste men, I mean, boys, and here comes in the toilets. Water, yes. Functional, yes. But the way it is designed, that, you know, like, okay, that side is the boys' toilet, and this side is the girls' toilet, and the boys all stand there and mask, mask with the girls' toilet. So they leave. So you broke these. Now, coming to the question of caste abuse, I've done a survey of some 200 schools across the country. 20% of the sample was Dalit. Caste abuse in the classroom is very common. Per se, in the act, there's nothing wrong with it. Yes, there's a lot of wrongs in the land acquisition bill. But these three acts, there's nothing wrong. So we have to keep that in mind. About culture and culture. And we have to be a lot more specific, you know, using terms like tribals. Because when you take your cut situation, the Rajput landlord don't feel this. The Rabaris, the Darbars, they face this problem. They are also facing tremendous problems because of the dampening of the market in Emirat. Chinese silk and the Chinese ways of copying it is replacing. Raj Mahila because Sangha has been working for donkeys here, they are facing a crisis. If you go to the maze towards Naksana, they are facing a similar problem. This side, among the tribals, there are many tribals in Odisha, various conditions. But the common problem should be a decline in public investment. Nationally, at, at the state level, the share of expenditure on development, education, health, infrastructure, is declining gradually. The consumer price index for agriculture, labor is rising gradually. In India, when the this urban is with inflation rate has formed. So these are things we have to look at. Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. There are two more questions and come back. Amit, I, I just want to highlight one point you made about ecosystem services. I think there's not adequate realization. There's a lot of migration in our country at the moment. Last year I saw in Maharashtra, lack of water, there were no water in the village, so they, in the carts they were moving about. I, unless there is going to be awareness, what we know, what are called the climate refugees, one class of new kind of, new kind of, category of refugees. There is going to be a lot of problem in this country, both along the coast 
Kerala, for example, will have a large number of people who have to leave that place because of higher sea level rise. Many cases water, many cases of land collapse. So the ecosystem services in the future are going to be one of the very important causes of migration. But no anticipatory action or any planning because very few people, I, I, that's why I was happy when you talked about it twice because it's not very much realization of the importance of uh, the ecosystem services. I think the time we realize them and do something about it first to stop the collapse of the ecosystem. Secondly, to prepare if it's inevitable, if the services are going to dry out, as yes, in some parts, then we'll have to have anticipated action. Otherwise, there'll be a lot of human suffering. Good evening, everyone. I am Lawrence from Madras School of Social Work. My question is, for the agrarian society, migration is a, creating a greater impact. And recently, Make in India is a new trend being announced by Prime Minister. And there are lots and lots of initiatives and uh, canvas is going on to implement it. And what is the stand of uh, you dignitaries on this Make in India and the agrarian society. Will more migration happen uh, creating the agriculturalists in trouble or the cost of uh, the food products or movement of rural community to urban increase? And the process of highlighting this one is again you're very right. And the other part of this thing that you know anticipating climate change has been a part of Indian tradition. All these water bodies, nobody here from Karnataka, I think, no? Aries, Kundams, they were there. Those of you who have traveled down from Kerala to Kanyakumari, from Trivandrum to Kanyakumari, saline ingress was a part of the system. 1860, Markhanda Verma built a canal running parallel to the coast. Then somebody else repaired it and it was finally named uh, A.V. Markhanda Verma Canal to keep the saline ingress out. And alongside the canal, he built some big tanks, ponds for sweet water. Gradually, it gets eroded. I have traverse sections of it where it has been made into a volleyball court, collector inaugurates it. Every now and then the concerned member of parliament raises a bit of a ruckus in the parliament. So a few crores are allocated to it. Last time it happened was in 1978. That was the last time. Ramnad, and I feel very hesitant talking in front of Professor, but Ramnad was at one time a rice bowl of Tamil Nadu. The Rameshwaram temple, the nearest granite uh, quarries are about 80 kilometers away. Correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, you had to have that kind of surplus to build that temple. This, why, I mean, the, that particular variety, I'm sorry about my Tamil, of rice was internationally famous. Why? Because of the water management systems. 18 and from 1960, when it goes to PWD, the whole water system is ruined. It becomes a desert bowl. People from inside are migrating either as charcoal workers or as coolies in the fishing industry in which MSSRF has worked. We get an Israeli technology to filter the water. They underestimated the, um, in the saline content of the seawater, so it fails. Yet, to answer your question about Make in India. Make in India is nothing new. I, have any of you been to the temple at Suchindram on the west coast? No, not It's on the border. I'm sure you didn't climb uh, Yamuna, the Gopuram. If you climb the Gopuram and it's getting ruined, so better go and see it fast. There are lovely wall paintings of Chinese traders coming there. There's only one of them left inside the temple behind where you have those, that pillar, this side, that is getting eroded. 
make in India was very common. Siddhapadikaram is the perfect example of the industries which was made in India. Only thing there was, I'm not glorifying the past. There were many problems. It was highly casteist, highly sexist. But there were certain safety funds, certain balance. Today that is getting ruined. Making India to use the cheap labor the way it is happening in the IT industry. Just sweatshops. So we know what is going to happen. Ecology gone for a crisis. Look, I mean, if you look at any document in the last six months, this investors can't claim this, that. Biggest crisis, land and environment. Compromise, trade off. How can you trade off with water? How do you trade off with water? So migrate. Migration is bad. We have the Bombay people creating a noise. We have the Delhi people creating a noise that those are outsiders, keep them out, so put big fences. I studied in an institution designed by a man called Lori Baker. And when this debate was going on, on you know, import substitution, this is an old debate. One day he made a very nice cartoon of people jumping into a factory from like in his bagging. And at the end of it, sausages coming out and written there for export only. We are heading for that kind of situation. But the poor are going to jump in, become sausages, and get export. I have a very simple question. No, Amit is only only scaring me like, you know, we have all the issues in India. I I know you travel a lot and you have a lots of experience. Can you suggest or can you tell us that some good example also, which is also working and is a working model? Of what? About this. About this subject. I'll start off with a very simple one. Alwar showed the highest rate of Alwar in Rajasthan had one of the highest uh, like female feticide rates. Two NGOs got together. They started off with this thing that this is going to be a child labor free village and also we'll uphold the right to be born. In terms of schooling, even before the RT came up, we have the Hoshangabad experience, we have the Nawada experience, where every child was going to school and learning joyfully. In Tamil Nadu, there are quite a few experiences of this going to school and learning joyfully. In terms of preventing migration, Naigao village, which is barely about 80 kilometers from Pune, Vilas Rao Selonke started this experiment of water, I mean, treating water as a common property resource and conserving it and sharing it equitably and using it to empower the 20% Dalit families. So, examples also, there are plenty. The reason why I hesitate to give examples is that many of us have written about them, drawn lessons from them. They all get, you know, really nicely put down as files and examples are quoted and then they are used. Oh, if you could, so and so could do it, why not? In terms of an example of this kind of an understanding, this understanding is not totally my own. A British consultant called Volker was sent by the imperial government to write on the conditions of agriculture. He wrote quite a few of these things. And he wrote a sentence saying that, look, I couldn't find anything to teach the Indian peasantry. When I compared with the British, maybe the Britishers could learn something. I still don't know how Volker got his consultancy fees. They didn't cancel it. <laughs> so, there are plenty of it. Volker committee report is there in the library. 
So you can look up that also, and maybe tomorrow, but yeah, actually, you could do that. You know, we are going through a training present group here also. So tomorrow, make a 15 minute presentation on the Volka Committee report. Okay, Yeah. But, yeah, yeah, he wanted to know whether he could help us in our gym program. I said, okay, I think I'm going to sign Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, before we close, only one question. Is that time? Yes. But for you, you You can conclude that. No, Yeah, that was making a conclusion. Raise a point. I wanted to <coughs> give a very sad story of gender conflict which has been brought about by the state. So I think the state is there to promote development or at least not stand in the way of it. Uh, this is from Tamil Nadu. I think many of you even who those who are not from Tamil Nadu must be aware of the enormous amount of uh, distribution of uh, specially useful things like grinders, mixies and various other things to women from poor families. And this is, uh, you know, something which people admire about her because she has helped so many women in poor families, you know, very woman supportive CM who has been going all out to give things to uh, women. I don't know how many of you know how all these expenditures are met. When the chief minister gives a lot of things uh, away, who is paying for it? And all the money which is used for this, which most people may not know, comes from the liquor tax. So that is why there are Tasmac shops at every corner. That is why men are encouraged to drink. No, we always talk about male alcoholism. I'm trying to tell you the background story of it. So listen seriously, I'm not joking. Cheap liquor available at every corner by government order. Who is encouraging? Government is offering, in Tasmac are all government shops offering cheap liquor, which is liquor shops open at 6 a.m. and are open till 10 p.m. Who is giving them permission to keep their liquor shops open? Is it the men? No, it's the government. So government is encouraging, promoting and enhancing the drinking habit of men. Men, of course, like a drink. For that, case, for that remark, lots of women like a drink. It is not publicly talked about because women are rarely found drunk on the road. They drink inside their homes. So all this, you know, goody-goody thing that men drink, first of all, drinking is universal. And if you, any, if you, any of you have visited any tribal community, you will see in all their celebrations, both women and men are drinking. It's only in our middle class society that women have to hide in their houses and drink. In case you think there are no middle class women drinkers. So the point I'm trying to make is that the impact of these liquor shops is on the one hand, the state gives gifts to lots of women. On the other hand, if you study the male mortality rate in Tamil Nadu, you will see that the huge, you know, up jump, which should be abnormal in men between the ages of 40 and 50. I mean, that's not a normal age for dying. You expect at least 60 plus people may start dying. But death preceded by disease, so that makes men unable to work. They drop out of the workforce, they can't work, and the burden, of course, is on the families. This is being leading to some years of illness, 
that is has to be financed by the families. So the burden is also on the women because they have to somehow earn enough to get the treatment and the hospital treatment for the men. Eventually the men die at a very young age. You know, 50 is not a big age, leaving a widow with four or five children uh, to take care of. This is our government policy. That's the answer. Go and take your widow pension. Thank you. I hope you get my message. I have been working in, uh, with the Tamil Nadu women, self-help group women. I have been doing gender and life skills program. I have done it almost in 23 districts. And I see all this development one side, another side, we never question the power relationship or gendering process. That's the biggest problem. So even women who are empowered, who take loan from this, they ultimately spend on the uh, power relationship on the gender. That's one Amal is the liquor process. So we can feel one way happy that women are now becoming, families are becoming female headed. But what is the reason behind becoming female headed? So the gendering process is never questioned in the whole developmental question. You're very right. That you know, I mean, and I get very often pulled up for this, for not seeing the other half and all that brighter side. I mean decision making. We always have decision making. How many pressure cookers, who buys clothes. Some basic decisions we don't question. The woman's right over her body. With the increase in alcoholism, the right over the body is eroding very fast. Women have to take permission. If say they have two daughters, they want to go in for a sterilization, they have to take permission, they can be thrown out. The age at which her daughter should, I'm not talking of Tamil Nadu only, the age at which her daughter should be married. Can she decide that? Yet we talk of decision making that earlier she couldn't say anything, she didn't have any say on buying um, the kitchen gadgets. Now she has. But the, some of the basic things, can she go and do something? I mean, how many women, for instance, when they go and try and file an FIR for her daughter being molested? Or if the brother-in-law molests the young baby, can she fight it? So those decisions we don't question, but we get apparently satisfied. Then also documenting their success stories. So the government was more interested in me documenting how many cows they have got. Oh, I said yeah. after this, I questioned women, what are the social issues that you have dealt with? Exactly. So some of the villages, they have driven the liquor shop 2-3 kilometers away from their village. And they have intervened in the marital relationship, all that uh, kind of problems. So I was more interested in uh, some of the uh, uh, women get together and really they drive away the liquor shop. At least let the men uh, walk two or three kilometers away from the uh, you know, you know, wonderful uh, case of Doba Gunda. <laughs> Doba Gunda in Andhra you must have heard how the women of that village, starting from the canteen day, Andhra became liquor free for two years. And it was also related, related to literacy. And then how Narasimha Rao's uh, elder son became the education minister and the people in the liquor lobby pressurized him and he did prohibition. So that side is also there. Yeah. Thank you very much. With this, we'll close the session now. We have been discussing for the last uh, one and a half hours on different aspects in the rural life, how it is affecting the relationship. That is basically a power relationship between men and women as well as among the different caste groups at the local level. So these broader changes, I mean, uh, it is coming from different uh, directions, ultimately affecting the development work. How we are going to take it forward and sustain it, it's a kind of a broader issue. Everyone should consider in the work. And I thank all of you for your uh, participation and my special thanks to Nitya and Amit for sharing the personal experiences for the past 20 to 30 years they have been gaining and uh, uh, observing from the field 
relating to the overall framework which is happening in the national level. Thank you very much.